The business model that we're working on has endured for a long time. That is good news, it's had a very good stability. Many of us are older than IBM, but now we have to see whether that, that, will, that will follow through into the future. Primary fu funding source, of course, is student revenues. Endowments uh, vary fairly widely. What we need to do is to find an operating structure that really works If our prices rise in faster than household income, and household income's been pretty flat, then the only way that we'll be able to then meet expected family contributions is to find some way to be able to do it with financial aid. If, if we can construct a model where our tuition goes up 4% and financial aid goes up 4%, that would be a good thing. But almost all of us, if you look at those discount rates, have seen our financial aid demand rise faster than our increases in tuition. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through some sample financial statements. The major revenue sources are net tuition, room and board, endowment, and gifts. And then the expenses are a compensation program and debt and capital. I just used just a simple 60, 30, and 10 split. The key column then for all of the math going forward will be growth rates. Then you can see the red numbers get to be fairly sizable. The really big numbers in these places are student revenues and compensation. In fact, they're very similar in size. This is 60, and this, and actually net tuition, is about 60. So as people talk on campuses about where you might be able to get more revenue or cut expenses, unfortunately, some of those conversations are around the little numbers. All we have to sell is the people we have. You guys are the show, and, the, and people come to these colleges because you're here. They don't come because we run a great accounts payable department, even though we do. They come because of what student affairs can do to give them a student experience. And making sure that we can have sufficient dollars to be able to support that. Perhaps we could find a different or new revenue source. Let's say we find something where we can bring people to our campus or otherwise sell or leverage something that we have that grows at an outsized rate, 10% a year, if you go down to the bottom line here, you see all those numbers are just about as red as they were before. And that's because what our base operation, our base business, if you will, is so big that that's just not big enough to make a huge difference without still addressing the rest of what's going on. So let's just add some more students. So the next scenario will add 100 students permanently. It, it, from year one to year two, the student body will jump up by 100, and then that 100 will hold for the rest of the time. It does help us for a while, but then after that, we're back to a trend line that, uh, that has the same growth parameters we had before, um, with revenues growing more slowly than expenses. Perhaps we should just tell the fundraisers to raise some more money. There are generally some opportunities to broaden the base of giving. In terms of alumni participation, in my experience, 50% is a gold standard, and very few schools get to that. So in this case, I've now changed the gifts and others to grow at 10% per year compounded. Every year. Not This isn't a 10% kick in one year because we had a great reunion or we had a particular event on campus. This is 10% year after year after year. This is generally the smallest component to the revenue picture, so even a significant increase also only has a modest effect. What if we decided the expenses would be the way to solve this notion? What I did was to change the growth rate in the expenses to balance the budget, but I only did them one at a time. If compensation grows rather than 4% a year at 1.3% per year, the whole thing will balance. If we said, oh, we really can't do that, the 4% is what we really need to have available for compensation and benefits and health care and so forth, what if we just said, let's go to all these budgets that aren't people and they aren't capital, and let's just see what happens if we manage those expense budgets. Those expense budgets would have to be cut by 2.3% every single year. Let's go after debt and capital. We don't really, I mean, it doesn't really look like it's so bad. I mean, the building isn't really falling down. It's not leaking in my office. And that one would have to be cut by 10% a year every single year it is unlikely that you would try to balance any budget by isolating one category and say everybody else is protected. I wanted to put this in just to give you a sense of the magnitude. 
none of those numbers is acceptable. Um, this is all a numerical exercise. In part, it is designed, though, to try to help people understand the magnitudes of the different sizes of the numbers. Working on this and trying to figure out where it goes is not the job of the president, or it's not the job of the CFO who runs lots of spreadsheets. It's everybody's job. And the, the more people understand, you know, again, th th this is not sort of a painting of what will be. It's just this is kind of what the dynamics are. And unless the economy turns into, turns a, makes a left turn and gets better like it was in the past, we have some things to work on. But from, from my point of view, I want as many folks in my place who can help me think about this as possible. I want the admissions to think about it. I want the fundraisers. I want my faculty leaders. I want my student affairs folks. Everybody's got to try to figure out what we can do and think about this because we, we got a lot of years left. <laughs>